Welcome. This is uh, Christopher Moyer coming to you from Denver, Colorado, and I'm joined today by Brian Rutledge. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing well, Chris. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us. Brian and I are going to be discussing a uh, topic that came up in my Facebook group the other day, uh, the possibility of robotic massage therapy. But uh, let me tell you a little bit more about Brian first. Brian Rutledge is an educator and licensed massage therapist in Philadelphia. His private practice integrates somatic education and manual therapy. He's also an instructor for the Philadelphia School of Massage and Bodywork and is a moderator for the Explo Exploring Pain Science Facebook group. And uh, he's also an active participant in my own Facebook group that we're going to take a peek at in a moment because I want to show a video. So uh, <laughs> welcome, Brian. Uh, hey, thanks for uh, thanks for sending out the invite, and I'm I'm glad you're showing the video. I think it's a cool one. Yeah, let's do that. So um, there's a pretty lively discussion in my Facebook group the other day about this uh, video, and uh, in case uh, people aren't certain uh, what we're going to be talking about, let me just take a moment to share my screen and show what we are. That did not work. How do I, oh, there we go. Are you seeing my screen, Brian? Yep, got it. Okay, so I uh, posted this link the other day. So when we're talking about robot massage here, we are not talking about uh, just the kind of uh, thing you hold in your hand and to use to massage your shoulders, but we're looking at a complex device here that is capable of doing a full body massage and presumably is able to uh, sense the position of the person's body and alter uh, pressure and techniques and so on. Uh, and so, yeah, this led to a really lively discussion about whether such a thing could ever perform at a high level. But it also has, I think, serves as an interesting jumping off point for thinking about what massage therapy even is. Uh, and what the key components of it are, whether it's performed by a machine or by a human being. So you get the idea there. Uh, for anyone seeing this video who's not a member of my group, if you look on Facebook for science of massage therapy, meditation, and related topics, uh, you can find my group and uh, join it if that is the kind of thing you're interested in. So let me uh, rejoin the video here. And where should we begin with this interesting topic? What, uh, because I think we're going to talk about a lot of different things, but how do you think we should start? Well, I think my first thought was uh, looking back at some of the conversation that was had in the last day or so when, since you posted the video, there was an initial question that you asked that I actually never answered looking back at some of my comments, and that was, would I try this? And uh, yeah, I would try that. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I must have been someone else who asked that because I just assumed you would try it. I would say try it too. Why would? Yeah, it seems like uh, so long as I could have some sort of basic level of guarantee that it's not going to crush my bones, I think I'd be into it. Yeah, you'd want to be sure there's a kill switch attached to it somewhere. Right. Yeah, safety features definitely need to be sort of in place, but beyond that, I mean, I've tried all other manner of uh, sort of technology to squish on my muscles and usually it feels pretty good. Agreed. So one of the reasons that this video really captured my imagination and that I wanted to post it is uh, quite a few years ago. In fact, uh, now that I think about it, it's probably 20 years ago, which is crazy for me to think about. 20 years ago when I was first getting started doing some massage therapy research as a senior in college, I interviewed some massage therapists uh, this was in New Hampshire where I, where I was going to school. And one of the things that I asked each of them was about, um, about just this possibility. The question was, you know, do you think, I wish I knew the exact question, but it was along the lines of, do you think that a robot massage therapist, if the technology was very, very advanced, could ever uh, deliver an effective massage to, to the same degree or better than a uh, capable human massage therapist. And the point of the question wasn't to assess their knowledge of technology. The point of the question <laughs> was to get us thinking about, you know, what is massage therapy and yeah. what elements of it are essential for it to be good. 
And, uh, you know, that was so long ago, I don't have their answers anymore, but it's something that's always been on my mind as an interesting thought experiment. Mm -hmm. So uh, what if we were to ask you that? If the technology was sufficiently advanced, mm -hmm. do you think that such a contraption would deliver a good massage? Well, um, I mean, the short answer is, yeah, probably. But again, coming back to this discussion that was had previously, it depends on some of the definitions there in the question. So, okay. um, you know, the type of massage, for instance, what's the particular goal of the massage? If the goal of it is just to have someone sort of feel nice and have a sort of generally pleasant experience and maybe be able to relax a bit throughout the process, I think definitely achievable with technology. Maybe not at its current state, but um, as you and I were already discussing, the, the rate of these things kind of getting better is is much more than than we can really kind of imagine. <laughs> So probably sooner than we think, it, it, we probably could achieve a, a goal like that. Um, but of course, that's not why humans always get a massage. The number of reasons why humans might get a massage are, are vast. And some of those particular goals, I think technology might have more trouble catching up to. That's Many bad. of them probably still. So, um, you know, the reality is it's a, it's a human interaction, like point blank. Sometimes, and I'm sure if there are therapists who've been working out there for a little while, they might have had a client over the span of their career who maybe at first was seeing you for some back pain or related issue, but at some stage, and you may have even have had a discussion, and I've had to have this discussion, they're essentially seeing you because they don't have a social circle, and so they're paying you to, to be in contact with a person for an hour. Um, and they might not know that in an explicit way, but when it comes to what are the reasons that they're coming to see you and you can start to eliminate more and more of them. It's like, oh, this is because maybe you're lonely. And I think um, to the degree that technology can solve for making someone feel like they've had a connection and solving for loneliness, uh, that's, um, that's something that might not be the explicit role of massage therapy per se, but it is something that people might be getting from massage therapy that technology would have trouble keeping up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't even have a lot to add uh, to that. I mean, I just think that makes perfect sense. And then, of course, that raises the question, if we're going far enough into the future and far enough in the technological advancement, are machines ever going to get to the point that they are able to combat loneliness or that they're able to provide a simulacrum of human companionship and of course mm -hmm. there's all kinds of interesting you know science fiction that has explored that but we're getting closer and closer to that not being science fiction we're getting closer sure. to the possibility at least that that could actually happen yeah and uh, science fiction is an interesting thing because um you know I, I love me some good science fiction and some of the best stuff is stuff that feels kind of close to home, based in, to some degree in reality, and it's making a not implausible prediction. Um, and in reality, uh, when you're going through the scientific process itself, uh, when you're trying to think, based on what you've been able to observe so far, what might be next, or sort of dreaming up what a solution to some problem might be, you're sort of dabbling in a type of science fiction, making a guess at something sure. and trying to figure out what it might be. So there's not a huge difference between those two things, except for that one's entertainment and one's for sort of trying to further human knowledge. But uh, not surprising that they sort of cross over um, given enough time. We've seen that happen a lot with different science fiction writers being very prescient about things that were to come later. Right. And I think it was I think it was you very early in the discussion who asked the question, you know, I posed the link and uh, the discussion only just gotten started. And you posed a question along the lines of, you know, do, do you think technology is ever going to replace human beings in psychotherapy or in counseling? Right. And I think you posed that question to be, you know, a little bit provocative to sort of highlight the human aspect of massage therapy. And you maybe weren't anticipating my answer, which was that's already happening. Yeah. And I, I, 
I spent a little time yesterday searching for some links that I used in a class I taught about a year ago, and I, I didn't find the links just yet, but I will find them. Mm -hmm. the, the United States Veterans Administration is already using uh, computerized therapists to interview and do really rudimentary psychotherapy with soldiers who have post-traumatic stress disorder. And the, the, it's really amazing how good it is. I mean, it's also, a, it's also not that good, right? It's not a human being. There's all right. kinds of things it can't do, but right. even what it can do is amazing. Right. Like it, it reads the person's face. And so it's got a sense of what the person is doing emotionally. Absolutely. It, it listens to what they say and responds in a meaningful way and in a relatively timely fashion. It's a yeah. little slower than a human being, but it, it's already collecting information from human beings in a way that simulates what an actual human being would do. So this is already happening. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'd say that's not, it's just a different form for something that maybe humans have done before. Um, what I mean by that is, so that the term you use there, relative, right? It's amazing, but I mean, well, relative because it's still very early on and certainly it's nowhere near the capabilities of another person. Yeah. Um, and so the, the thought that came to mind is, you know, uh, to me it's amazing that my dog shakes my hand but it's not, you know, relative to a human being, it's not super impressive the way that a dog <laughs> shakes hands. Um, but then I'm thinking a little bit more about, again, dogs. Um, dogs read human faces. They yeah. didn't start off doing that. You know, these are, these are sort of uh, the happiest version of wolves that we could make. And, you know, in a way, by crafting that biological technology to sort of suit humankind, We've started to do this in one format or another before. It's just the tools yeah. we have for it now are are probably going to have a greater potential. Um, but I mean, therapy dogs are a real thing. It's funny, <laughs> and, it's funny and you mentioned, we made those. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned dogs because literally just yesterday I saw a tweet that that spoke to this dichotomy. It, the tweet said, you know, dogs able to use their uh, olfactory sense to detect disease in human beings, which is unbelievable and a thing that's actually real. And then it said also dogs and it showed a gif or a gif of the dog trying to attack windshield wipers through the uh, yes. shield of the car. And, you know, it gets right at the, the way, you know, on the one hand, it's got this super ability that we can exploit. On the other hand, it doesn't understand what windshield wipers are. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it and that you know speaks to the kind of thing that we're looking at with robotic massage therapy on the one hand there's there's no limit to how good a robot massage therapist could be right it could be customized to the precise anatomy of every single person that it works on right it potentially could uh, work on the anatomy in a way that maybe is better than any human being because it could have, it could, it would never get tired. It would never lose concentration. It could have all the anatomical information programmed into it. It could have better sensitivity in terms of what it's feeling on its robot hands. And then on the other hand, it's, it's a dumb machine, right? It's never going to give yeah. you a warm well, feeling of companionship. Yeah. There's, and I would say here that, this is, there's a long way to go for some of those things. And even though it is accelerating rapidly, um, long way to go for some of those things. Um, and so I, I agree with pretty much everything you're saying, or it's just to say, I don't know, right? It's the best answer yeah. you can give. I don't know, but potentially. Uh, the only thing I would sort of rule out is um, any of the absolute statements. Not a big fan of those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely better than any human being, <laughs> than most. Here's what I would say. There are machines now that do all manner of things that humans used to do and objectively on almost every measure better, right? I mean, like uh, a great deal of, for instance, bread, something I know you like to make as a human. <laughs> uh, bread gets made by machines for sure. And, and a huge amount of bread that is sold is made in that way. And yet we haven't completely gotten rid 
of a human being making bread. Right. And I think that there will always be a space in our culture for even if, let's say, robotic massage does develop to be sufficiently advanced that it's better than human beings able to, being able to do it, there's still, I think, going to be a role for human beings because the sort of like, um, I feel like in our culture, there'll always be a version of hipsters, if that makes sense. Like someone's always going to want an artisan handmade massage. There's always going to make sense. Right. There's always going to be enthusiasts. There's always going right. to be craftspeople. I, I take your meaning with, with hipsters, but I mean, we can even take that word out of the equation. And sure, I know sure. exactly what you're saying. Like, even if I had a, you know, even if the technology existed to, robotically make bread as as good as the bread that I make. And for those of you who don't know, I make some seriously good bread. Um, I mean, I'm I'm joking around, but I'm also serious. Um, you know, would I would I still do it? Yeah, I would still do it because I, Absolutely. I enjoy doing it. I mean, there are still automobiles being built by hand right now. And there's a premium on those automobiles. There yeah. are things exactly. being completely yeah, oh, so I just got excited. I was just saying, I mean, set aside building it by hand. I was in a discussion with a friend of mine from the world of massage. Uh, Adrian Hirsch uh, made a post about, you know, being thumbs down on self-driving cars. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're setting aside the building of it, the operation of it, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, in our lifetimes, we're going to see, no one's going to need to drive a car, whether that's right. going to be widely adopted or not, I don't know. But the technology is almost there now. Mm -hmm. yet people like driving cars, right? Yeah. So they're going to want to be able to drive cars and for all kinds of reasons, for the enjoyment of it, for the feeling of control. Some people are never going to trust technology, you know, so on and so forth. So, I mean, I think we've got, you know, that thing yeah, and I think what this thing, what this often comes down to, is it begins the discussion as is this possible, right? Because before it's blatantly possible. Like in the near future, we'll see. I suspect that autonomous driving, for instance, is possible. We'll have proof of it because they'll just be doing it at level four autonomous, and we won't have to wonder if it's possible. And right now, there's really not much wonder about whether or not it's going to be possible. It seems like it's. It's uh, yeah, sort of on, say it's, on the it's horizon. It's it's virtually there now. I mean, cars right. park themselves and, and all so that. Then the, yeah. When we stop wondering about whether something is possible because it's objectively observable and we can go, yeah, we can do that now, then the discussion starts to become, before it's widely adopted, will this replace X, Y, or Z? Um, and it's often a mostly yes, but also both and. I mean there are still men riding horses. There are police officers on horses. Now, they don't use them as their main mode of transportation. There's actually a great joke about, uh, I just heard the other day about police officers on horseback and that uh, if you ever see someone's purse get stolen, you'll never see that horse go charging after them. Mm -hmm. Usually what you'll see is that police officer say, yeah, I'll take a photo. <laughs> and so they're sort of being used for different purposes, but yet we don't leave it behind. And, and I think, Almost in every case, when there's a discussion that begins as an either or, the best solution to that is to say, well, both and. Both and is, is kind of going to be how it ends up. And so I say, I'm all for uh, robots doing massage therapy because I still will too. Yeah. So I'm just thinking, and dead air is not good for a broadcast, I realize, but, yeah. but thinking is good. Um, <laughs> why don't we, let's, just for fun, oh, and I, I want to say this before I forget, you know, lest there's anyone who uh, was involved in that discussion and thinks that my enthusiasm for this topic is because I don't believe in human massage therapy or because <laughs> I just... I, that is not the case at all. I mean, the, the, what got me interested in massage therapy, you know, 25, 30 years ago and, and keeps me interested in it today are all the ineffable uh, qualities of it. You know, the, the fact that we can't reduce it to its mechanics, the fact that it seems to deliver psychological benefits that are uh, sizable and consistent. Um, so if anyone thinks that, you know, this guy who's a scientist thinks, oh, we'll just have these machines and that'll take care of everything. It, that's not mm -hmm. what I truly believe. But I, I think it's I think the technology is fascinating. 
And I think that as a thought experiment, this is hard to beat. What if we, just for fun, because I think we're going to go beyond what was listed in that discussion. What if you sure. and I did a, a ping pong round right now where we listed the benefits of robotic massage therapy or the potential benefits? I'll do okay. one, hand it off to you, and we'll see how far we can go. So uh, why, don't you, why don't you take the first one? Okay. Well, I mean, the, the, the first is the most obvious, right? So it's going to deliver sort of therapeutic levels of mechanical force to the surface of human skin. Okay. Uh, I will say that it does not fatigue. The machine okay. is not going to not going to get tired the way a human massage therapist would. Uh huh. I would say it removes certain sort of social barriers. For instance, uh, no one's going to be worried about assault. Good. That's a good one. I mean, they're they're. Um, you actually covered a bunch of them there by saying social factors. So yeah, <laughs> uh, assault is not going to be a problem. Right. Embarrassment about one's body is going to be much less right. an issue or maybe No not. therapist complaining about smelly feet on social media. Good, good, bad. <laughs> it's not going to talk about you. It's not going to shame you for your body. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to add one other under that umbrella, which is um, some people when they receive massage therapy, whether they should or not, they feel a pressure to keep a conversation going. If you're being yeah. massaged by a robot, that, that pressure is gone. You can just tune out if that's what you want or need to do. All right. Yeah. So. Well, this, that, that goes to well, which robot and how far in the future are we? Because again, if it's, uh, if it's going to be delivering something beyond the, the psychosocial benefits that come strictly from the manual contact, and it's starting to do something like just empathetic listening beyond trying to get into the realm of really just doing some sort of psychotherapy or analysis or anything of the kind, but just empathetic listening is going to need to then be able to respond, understand the context. And so to that degree, it's like, well, maybe it, maybe you will still feel some sense to, to communicate with this thing. And I think ultimately what I was getting at with my first question in response to this video was that the communication aspect here is really important. Um, and that's often one of my favorite things to talk about with my students, um, even just viewing what we do with manual therapy as an intervention, uh, metaphorically as a, as a medium for communication. Uh, so we often use sort of um, language around this, like you're going to have a listening with your hands or Rather than, I, I like to use that, sort of extend that and say, you try not to shout at someone or lecture them with your hands, right? Mm -hmm. If you can conceptualize it as a conversation, you're a lot less likely to be doing too much. You're mm -hmm. going to spend more time listening and less time just sort of berating someone with just one push and pull after another. Um, and that kind of keeps you in the mindset of recognizing that there's a nervous system that has to integrate all the stimulus and giving it some time to do that. and listening to how it's responding to it, forming it around a conversation. Um, so thinking of it metaphorically as communication mm -hmm. um, and being able to apply what you're doing that way, I think that's one of the things that technology was probably going to struggle to do mm -hmm. over time um, because it's, there's more than just mechanical forces being applied going on. Um, and that's, I think, the pushing on bodies it could probably do now. I mean, just the video that you posted, I was like, yeah, I would let that thing push on me. What I wouldn't let it do is detect my response to its pushing because it's just so far from that. You don't think it already does that? Because watching the video, I've got to believe that it's not just, you know, got the mechanical complexity of a, of a bandsaw or something like that. I've got to believe it's got feedback built into it so mm -hmm. that it is altering what it's doing in response to the person on the table. I would think it has yeah. to have some of that. Now that the complexity of it, the sophistication of it, I don't there know. There we go. There we go. It's going to take some measurements, right? It's going to have some sensors. I mean, just as a safety backup. Yeah. And as it gets more and more complex, it'll have a greater degree to do some of those things with great skill. Yeah. Um, but fundamentally, it's processing all this stuff as sort of quantitative data. And um, I think one thing that people are still quite good at that technology struggles with is trying to make decisions based on sort of qualitative feedback um, and getting a sense, getting a feel for reading someone's body language, listening very carefully to the way that they're breathing and if it's changing, 
uh, if it's going to be doing all those things, it's got a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So we got about we had about three benefits. An another potential benefit is reduced cost. So once sure. the technology is sufficiently advanced, you know, I mean, nowadays a a session of well, what is what is an hour of massage therapy in the Philadelphia market likely to cost? You know, I think probably if you're averaging all of your options out, you're probably somewhere close to that dollar a minute range. And of course, it's going to depend on what section of the city you're in. That'll kind of vary it up and down a bit, too. But I mean, hey, we have the we have the chains out here, too. So right. you can sign up and get your membership and, and get your low, low cost if you need to. So there's a range. There's a, there's definitely a range. And I think that's probably true in any major city. But what if... I, and and I mean, this would be bad for people who I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact this would be bad for people to make a living doing massage therapy. But, you know, what if the robot was able to deliver an hour of massage and the price was twelve dollars and the quality of the massage was very good? I mean, that would be an yeah. advantage. That would be a disadvantage. That's a some people. possibility, by the way, as this technology sort of continues to progress, it's yeah. absolutely going to be remarkably cheaper. I mean, going back to the uh, the bread example, how much is Wonder Bread? You yeah, know? But Wonder, but Wonder <laughs> Bread sucks. It's not even bread. So, I mean, there's the other side of that. It's like, that's an but, interesting comparison, but also not a good comparison. But it also, for someone who maybe doesn't have the means to go get an artisan yeah. uh, loaf of bread, that makes bread much more widely available to a great deal of people. And that might be one of the upsides to technology. If you can deliver a pretty solid, relatively nutritious, but for someone who's with discerning taste, still kind of sucks by comparison, but it's 12 bucks. I yeah. take your point, but I think I think we already have Wonder Bread robotic massage. I think, <laughs> no, I think that, no. You're for, for so me, spot on with that. Yeah, I think the stick that you massage your, your shoulders with or the massage yeah. recliner, which those things are fine. Yeah. Um, that is Wonder Bread massage. For whereas, sure. Whereas what you and I want to talk about today, or I mean, what started it off is the possibility that a yeah. robot would do high level massage. That's a much right. more interesting. Okay. When I think, and I think, um, I think that that is probably going to happen and, and wonder bed will stop being such a good comparison. Yeah. Um, but it'll still sort of fit that model of likely to still be much cheaper than having a person do it because of all the advantages you already named, a single upfront cost, certainly the energy efficiency of it will probably improve over time. I mean, looking at the device that was in that video, mm -hmm. and thinking about where the technology would need to be to cover some of the bases that it's definitely not covering at the moment, um, it's gonna look a lot different. And I suspect um, it's not going to get, um, it's not going to end up, I should say, quite so large quite so complicated looking and, and being quite so energy costly because that's the line that most technologies take. And so it's just going to get cheaper and better. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to list another possible advantage that didn't come up in the discussion, but it, it builds on something someone said, you know, at least one commenter in that discussion said something along the lines of, well, you're never going to replace a human hand. And it is true, given current technology, that you know, uh, to to replicate or exceed what a human hand can do is is enormously difficult. And yet, it's worth thinking about the possibility, at least, that robot technology could have hands that do that go beyond what a human hand can do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And also that a robot could be constructed in such a way that it could maybe do massage that humans aren't capable of. It Absolutely. Could have, it could have multiple hands. It could yeah. have, it could perform techniques that would be very difficult for a human being to do. So it could even potentially take massage in directions that humans haven't been able to do. Yeah, well, and um, you know, there's there's things that I mean, I mean, just adding more and more hands, adding different kinds of pressure. I mean, the things that are already possible with, for instance, haptic technology. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we can't simulate touch in the way that tiny vibrational engines can already do that stuff. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think the reality that it, it's going to 
be able to sort of outperform us in, in many different ways is is true. And I think also, um, you know, we're conceptualizing this still in the mindset of sort of robots as we've seen them and as we've seen them depicted in science fiction. But, um, you know, biotech isn't going anywhere either. Mm -hmm. um, and so the reality that some of these things are going to start to look and become a lot more organic is also an inevitability in my mind. Yeah. Um, so that we couldn't replicate a human hand, I'd say, I don't know, we're already replicating some pretty complicated human stuff right now. Right, um, exactly. So... Uh... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, precisely. And, and, and another, another wrinkle as it relates to the thought experiment is, um, you know, folks who are of the position like, well, you're never, you know, a robot is never going to be able to perform massage at a high level because it's not human. All right, here's a provocative way to come at this. Human massage therapists are massage robots. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, yeah. Some people are yeah, gonna be really upset to hear me say that or they're going to misunderstand maybe what I'm I think to say, but many more people who are interested in watching your videos will probably just heartily agree with that because there's some you know if you're if you're taking that at all in a sort of uh, figurative sense that's a I mean that's good for a chuckle because we've all seen and experienced uh, feelings like that but to kind of take it in a slightly more literal sense right and kind of go with the thought experiment sort of purpose of that uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, even the way that it's originally taught, for instance, even in, in the school where I'm teaching, when fundamentals is taught, to get through that 101 level of course, you're learning a routine, which is a good baseline to begin with. And of course, as we get older and more accomplished, we go, oh, I don't use a routine. But the reality is we all start with a routine. And so that's like your basic programming. We are very much Mm -hmm. uh, learning it, not exactly in the way that you would teach a robot because we learn very differently, but um, that might not always be the case, first of all. And second of all, I think uh, it's it's just a, what you pointed out there is pretty apt. I think it's hard to disagree with the fact that basically what we're doing is very akin to being robots to begin with. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're in, immensely complex, but at some, at some level, you know, what we are is a, a mechanism with a you know nervous system computer that runs the mechanism in other words it gets at you know whether we are materialists or vitalists and mm. are, you know there are plenty of people out there who are still vitalists but um you know the 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 scientific the modern scientific position almost universally is materialism which and for anyone who's not familiar with this term i'm not talking about materialism like a love of money or a love of possessions i'm talking about the scientific position that life ultimately is a matter it is can be explained by matter in motion uh, that there's no ineffable human energy or life force that is outside of matter in motion which isn't to say that life isn't enormously on complex and, and not fully understood, because that's certainly the case. But mm -hmm. we don't need anything like a mystical or magical explanation or anything like Cartesian dualism to um, explore how life works. Yeah, I think um, for me, uh, I agree with 100% of that when we're talking about things and again, the sort of objective and literal sense. Mm -hmm. um, but to use the term need, I think that the humans do need good stories, right? We're, we're sort of, we're very built around narratives and narratives are very important to us. And so while I would say I'm sort of a materialist um, because I definitely enjoy me some good science and, and try to, you know, sort of have an evidence and science-based practice and so forth. But um, I have no problem with vitalism in a metaphorical sense because right. it's a good story. That's why it stuck around, I think, for as long as it has, because, hey, we, more than I think almost any other thing, uh, humans have been doing stories for a long time. Um, and it's a very important part of our existence. And I think um, actually that highlights something else coming back to this idea of the, an intervention and interaction, a therapeutic manual therapy interaction as a sort of multi multimodal means of communication and that being truly the intervention, nonverbal and verbal, et cetera, that um, 
there's a narrative structure around that often over the course of a particular interaction and sometimes over the course of several interactions. Um, and I think that technology would probably struggle to to create a kind of narrative in the same sort of an intentional way because humans just have a man a really lot of experience doing that. It's basically, I mean, it's it's in our DNA to to be consumed with stories and the importance of them and and the salience of them. Well, I certainly agree with you that um, you know human beings are all about. Uh... Um, story and metaphor and pursuit of meaning. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm with you 100% there. And um, I agree that vitalistic theories, when they're, when we understand them as metaphors, I can be on board with that. I don't, I don't have Bingo. a problem with that. I mean, too often, yeah. we see people subscribing to them literally, and I don't want us to get bogged down on that. But I do, some of what you're saying is, is dancing around something I'm really interested in. And also a moment ago when you were talking about how um, how students learn massage therapy, you were saying, well, mm -hmm. basically we start with a program and, and you made mention of, you know, the way we teach computers is, is different than that, but, and then you went on to some mm -hmm. other things. Yeah. And I think one of the most fascinating things about artificial intelligence nowadays is it's moving from programmed computers to now we've got at the highest level computers that are teaching themselves. Yeah, artificial and, intelligence, it's right. amazing. <laughs> and I'm not an expert on this at all. I'm just an enthusiast, but let me, let me say a little bit about the kind of thing that's going on. And I posted a link to this. Um, last year or earlier this year, I think it was earlier this year, Google has an artificial intelligence uh, division and they created a chess robot, essentially, that taught itself. All they did was, was put the rules of chess into it. They didn't feed it any historical games. They didn't give it any advice in the form of programming. They just built the rules of the game into it. And then they let it play against itself. Mm -hmm. so, and it took four hours for it to go from having no skill whatsoever because it had never played to playing at the highest level anyone has ever seen, four hours. Yep. Now, some of that is just computing speed, but the, the really interesting thing about it is that it started from zero. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people's understanding of computers, if, if that's not the field they work in, is that, well, computers can only do what you tell them to do or that, you know, they've got to be programmed. Well, that used to be the case to some degree. But if that was the case, they would be of no interest or, or use, actually. The thing that's amazing about them increasingly is that they can come up with solutions that weren't put into them. So... And now what they're seeing with these computers that play games at the highest level is the computers are coming up with moves and strategies that are astonishing to experts, things no one had ever thought of, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, sacrificing your queen on the fifth move for a positional advantage. Like no one would ever do that until now that they've mm -hmm. seen you can do things like that. So you know, to bring it back to massage therapy, and here I'm just, now I'm getting really into the realm of science fiction. <laughs> Imagine that the robot doesn't have massage techniques programmed into it, but imagine instead that it's got some kind of feedback mechanism in it where it tries things and it monitors the autonomic response of the person so that gradually over time it learns what techniques bring about a relaxation response. Mm -hmm. It might start to learn techniques that no human has ever stumbled across. I think it almost certainly would, yeah. I mean, that's that's a really interesting line of thought. And uh, I think, by the way, you have a bit of permission to go into the realm of science fiction since we started the conversation with robots doing massage. So uh, <laughs> I think... Um, yeah, I'm for one, I'm looking forward to artificial intelligence sort of creating these solutions that are maybe counterintuitive or essentially they're doing a, a, a bunch of trial and error. 
which is what humans have right. been doing since time immemorial. The difference is A, the speed, which you pointed out, but not just the speed, but the fact that a single computer or a sort of network of computers, but even with a single computer, um, they can do basically concurrent trials and also at blazing speed. So yeah. one computer is just not equivalent to one human. It's going at sort of a speed that no individual human can do, and it's equivalent to sometimes on the order of hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of humans trying something and right. each of them a different thing. And that's why it's able to learn to do these things so incredibly quickly. It, in, in, a, in a sense, I said they're, they're learning in a different way. Uh, artificial intelligence isn't actually learning in a fundamentally different way. It's kind of learning in the same way, but just with an incredible set of advantages because it can right, right. multiply itself and increase the speed at which it goes through these experiments. Right, so it's both things. And, and I'm gonna get the quote I'm going to get it wrong here, but I'll get the gist of it. I mean, back when Deep Blue defeated the chess champion Gary Kasparov, Kasparov later said something like quantity became quality or something like that. The point being, the thing is processing so much data mm -hmm. that, you know, a, a quality emerges from it. And, you know, there's all kinds of ways that that can be interpreted, but um, you know, to take it to the point that you just said, you know, I mean, a human massage therapist can only accrue 40 hours of 40 years of experience in an entire career. Mm -hmm. In theory, a computer can, you know, have hundreds of thousands of years of experience if it if it's operating at a high enough rate. And 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 vitally on top of that. You know, the ways that humans have advanced over time is, yeah, you have a 40 year career. And then how do we pass on that information? Right. Because, of course, we have built on top of information that previous generations of humans have done. But it's uh, it's really hard to get the exact information that's in it's, your head into awesome. a form that someone else. Exactly. It's got yeah. so uh, if it's if it's in communication sort of theory, again, there's a lot of noise in yeah. that signal. There's a lot of noise in that signal and trying to craft it in such a way that the receiver is going to get it with a high fidelity is just next to impossible, especially, again, relative compared to a computer where you can literally essentially copy paste everything that's been learned and just hand it off to the next one. And that's um, and really the only reason to do that is if the system is just so outdated because it's not like it's going to have a 10-year lifespan because the the sort of hardware has worn out, maybe some things will wear out, but it's much easier to fix them first of all. But in reality, you'll replace the entire thing before the hardware is completely worn out because you'll just have something so much better. And so both of those things, you can transfer everything that's being learned and the capabilities of the sort of physical hardware are advancing much faster than human hardware is advancing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be, I think, we're certainly a lot more reliant on various forms of technology now than we've ever been. And I see no evidence that that's going to sort of buck that trend where it's going to keep on happening until I think um, one of my favorite sort of futurist thinkers is Elon Musk uh, and among some others. And I'm sure he's, he's gathering some of these ideas from some like-minded individuals, but the idea that we're essentially, it's essentially going to be a merging of these two things at some point we will, we will enmesh with our technology at some yeah. stage. Well, we're all, I mean, that's already beginning, sure. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. my phone is my second brain. Right. Absolutely. Right. Uh, and it's upgradable, which is nice. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's, it's not only that it's like a brain outside of you, but the fact is, is, is your mind, which is grounded in your brain has taken that into account. You wake up in the morning and you think about things that an earlier generation would never have thought of. You're like, I wonder what my friends on Facebook are doing. You know, mm -hmm. I wonder if I've gotten any calls on this uh, thing from people from all over the world. So, you know, your mind has adapted to, you know, the world of the internet. So it's already, yeah. it's already happening and it's just gonna go and go and go. Yeah, you know? and the way that we interface with it is going to completely change over and over and over again to the point where the idea that there is an interface will almost be completely invisible and right. you won't even notice or feel it. Well, you know, that raises another point that I hadn't thought of till now, which is, you know, those of us in the discussion who are maybe late 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, we 
might look at a robot massage therapist and go, oh, that's, that's a little weird. That could never be that good. But part of the reason we might have that reaction is we can still remember a time when these technologies didn't exist. Whereas yeah. people who are, who are um, 20s or teenagers or younger right now, they're going to be so much more used to the idea of that course. technology works this way that they're not maybe going to be creeped out by a robot massage yeah. therapist in the same way, or they're not going to have the mental barrier that, oh, well, this could never be as good as a human being. They might have a different set of assumptions that causes them to have a different experience. Yeah. And uh, I think just kind of going off what we were just talking about, this sort of the advancing and the interface between us and our technology, um, they also might have a lot less reason to be creeped out by it than we could ever have imagined. So for instance, imagine we don't have to develop this incredibly sophisticated robot that has all of these special sensors and just delivering manual force. If the interface is so tightly woven into your nervous system that you don't have to hold a thing or touch a thing, um, maybe if you're experiencing something you'd rather not experience, the interface just provides your nervous system with all of the inputs of that experience without actually having to physically input them to your body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think something like that isn't so unimaginable. Um, there are already examples of technologies um, where we've been able to give people sensory experiences that they wouldn't ordinarily have. Right, right. Uh, or to replicate sensory experiences that their biology aren't really actually capable of, but right. we use the techno technological interface to just feed the brain and the nervous system those stimulus. And there's, you know, it's brains are easy to trick from the outside. And the further we start kind of really tightly inter interfacing technology with our nervous system, I mean, it's so easy to sort of trick it into just feeling like we need it to feel. Um, I can't imagine where that will go, but that's part of the fun of seeing where it goes. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, you and I have now talked for the better part of an hour and almost uh, everything we've talked about, which is fine. Yeah. Almost everything we've talked about has been like, oh, this technology is great. It's going to be so great. It's going to be so great. <laughs> and so I think we're apt to get anyone who watches this thinking, oh, Brian and Chris are mad scientists who hate human beings. Um, so maybe we should take a moment to mm -hmm. say, you know, maybe what this technology will never be capable of. Or yeah. Or why human. Well, I had a few but examples that I gave in, in our discussion originally. Um, so one that I think is a sort of perennial example for technology, uh, it's not so good at making humans laugh um, and being and having the creativity to do that. Um, another one that I gave as an example, um, in the early stages, it would be hard to provide something like empathy but I could see maybe where technology could catch up to that. Um, a more concrete example, I was thinking of what am I capable of? I'm a massage therapist, but I'm also a human being. What have I been able to do? You know, I can give someone a nice massage and a good experience, that's great. But I've also been able to, to my astonishment, convince a beautiful woman to be interested enough in me to reproduce another human being. I don't think that's, technology that's, is gonna outside, get to that. That's outside scope of practice, isn't it, Brian? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, but I'm just, so maybe not for um, a robotic massage therapist, but for sort of technology in terms of replacing human capabilities. Okay. I don't really see technology being able to do that quite so easily. Right. Um, and I mean, I'm teasing you because you're talking about human experience more broadly, but yeah. That well, and, and, and well, that's really what we're getting at though, is that that's what's missing. Right. And that's what these people who are sort of in our minds sort of complaining about how we're kind of giving all this to technology and not handing anything to humans. Fundamentally, what humans will always bring to the situation is the human experience. So right. uh, to take it back to the, I would so much rather have some of your bread that you've made, especially if I get to be there while you're making it. As mm -hmm. I see you make it, I see the process of making it. I can see that you're putting a lot of care and time and skill and expertise into making it. I smell it being made. All of those sort of experience elements um, are a lot different than the end product of uh, a really sophisticated piece of technology delivering me a seemingly similar loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, technology is amazing because it can do so many things very well and also very quickly, right? A lot of this has to do with speed and it does, the fact that it doesn't get tired. 
Um, I've had some of my greatest sessions with clients while I was tired. Right. And I think the fact that I got a bit tired was to my benefit. Right. Uh, I think we're, we're the human element, right, is the fallibility. And that's fundamentally what machines, of course, still are very fallible. Um, but to the degree that they advance and advance, they become less and less so. And the speed at which humans are becoming less fallible is uh, not really comparable. And But I think that can be to our advantage. The fact that um, these imperfections are are part of it. You're making me think about something that I thought about way back when I was being trained as a psychotherapist. Um, you know, there's a there's a clear body of research to show that psychotherapy is definitely effective in reducing anxiety, reducing depression, helping people quit smoking. I mean, all kinds of things you can imagine, a real range. There's no mm -hmm. doubt. There's no doubt about the fact that it works. Um, there's all kinds of questions about how it works. Sure, um, sure. Nobody knows for sure. And one of the things that was astonishing to me once I started thinking about it is typically if someone's doing psychotherapy, there are variations, but typically they're seeing a therapist once a week. And now think about this. There's 168 hours in a week and one hour a week you're talking with someone to try to get a handle on, let's say, anxiety. And mm -hmm. that's enough to, for like a significant effect to happen. Well, this is amazing. Yeah because it's such a tiny little part of your life experience. Well, one possibility that raises, I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities it raises, but one possibility it raises is that treatment extends far beyond that hour, that the patient, after they've talked with the therapist for that hour, now they're out walking around, they're going to work, they're doing all the things that they do, but their mind, they're thinking about what they've done. They're thinking about that person. Maybe one of the things that they're doing, not maybe, for sure, one of the things that they're doing is they're thinking about what that other human being, the therapist, thinks about them. And that's not going to happen, or it's like probably not going to happen with a robot massage therapist. So, you know, yeah. you're talking about could a, could a robot ever do something like empathy? And to that, I would say, yes, I think potentially, not with current technology, but sure, in potentially, it could give people the feeling that they're being understood. Um, mm -hmm. However, is that massage recipient later that day or the next day going to reflect on the humanity of that robot massage therapist? I would mm -hmm. say probably not. And maybe that's an important factor. Yeah, well, actually, there's a good example of something similar to this. So not only will they probably not reflect on the humanity of that interaction, right, what they were getting from it, but they're almost certainly, especially in the early days, so anything close to now, going to be specifically reflecting on the, the absence of the humanity. Yeah. Um, and so I was listening to a story recently where there's an app now that essentially is a very sophisticated chatbot that will help you and try to coach you through and, and sort of talk to you, be like a buddy slash a little bit of CBT kind of thrown in. Right. Um, and if it's, you know, of course, very rudimentary, but also, you know, surprisingly good and convincing at, at having a, a sort of natural conversation. Uh, and the story I was listening to had that person reflect on it a few months later after they had stopped using the application. Um, and all of the conversation was about how even while they were using it, they did feel a little bit better and maybe some of the intended effects were happening in the short term. In the long term, very creeped out by the fact that it wasn't a person mm. in a way that they had a hard time putting their finger on, but that they couldn't let go of to the point they were reflecting so much on the fact that it wasn't a human interaction that that almost became something to ruminate on to the point where they were like, wow. I can't use this anymore. Interesting. Uh, and so for seeing obstacles like that, um, we can try to, <laughs> but I don't think that we're going to nail them all. And uh, even artificial intelligence using its capabilities to try to foresee where there will be obstacles like that is not going to get to them all because it can do simulations of what its end of that interaction is going to be at great speed. Mm -hmm. and But it can't really do that with an actual human being, it has to then work at 
the speed of how many human beings can that system be interacting with at any given time. And if it's a broader system, certainly many, but still over the span of an hour, maybe happening once a week. So it's, um, it's going to be slow going. I mean, the reality is human beings don't have this down yet. And we are infinitely more complex already. Uh, so very, very tall orders here. So, uh, so those, uh, those people who might be thinking that we're coming down on the side of uh, technology again, you know, I think we both maybe have a little bit of an excitement and uh, maybe some biases around the fact that it's just um, most people are sort of underselling what technology is going to be able to do. Right. Um, but I want to be clear that it's an extremely tall order that no manner of intelligence, artificial or otherwise, has been able to genuinely accomplish. Um, humans are still just so-so at it. I agree, and you know that's you. You and I seem to have very much a similar opinion on this, which made for a good discussion. I think I also, <laughs> you know, we also could have a good discussion, including someone with a, a different opinion. But it turns out, sure. you have, I think that last one of the last things you said, I agree with a hundred percent. I, in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, some of the people who are involved in that discussion really underestimate where the technology is at already and yeah. how fast it's going. It's going. And, you know, I understand playing chess is not quite like doing massage therapy. I'm well aware of that. And I'm well aware mm -hmm. of the fact that doing massage therapy is complex. B yeah. Trust me, I know that. I hope no one thinks I think it's just a mechanical. <laughs> That's it. I'm, I'm very appreciative of how complex and human an activity it is. Um, but some of the things that computers are starting to do in terms <laughs> of things like, you know, navigating cities in a car or learning more chess than all of humanity has. Um, you know, I think maybe some people don't understand how complicated those tasks are and how unbelievably yeah. impressive they are. So um, the technology is, you know, to sum it up, we're going to see things that many people right now assume are impossible. We're going to see very soon. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's been the case all along. I mean, right. There's, right. That's, if, we're, that's if we're students of, if we're students of history, what we can sort of broadly say is that we have such a poor conception of what is to come. Yes. And and also when we reflect on the past, we're often astounded at how quickly things happened. Yes. Uh, and it's just something that it's not any specific culture. It's a human trait. Yes. Uh, nobody yes. seems to quite get it. And, uh, you know, that's part of the fun of being human. It, it allows for surprise. <laughs> Agreed. That's also, that's also some of the tragedy of being human. <laughs> hey, there's pros and cons to everything. I wouldn't yeah. want it any other way. I like some sweet with my sour. All right. <laughs> well, um, this has been a really good discussion, Brian. I really want to thank you for uh, joining me today. And, uh, you know, we've interacted online a lot, but we've never had the opportunity to act. Maybe, maybe we've crossed paths at like the pain summit or something. Have we met before? Did Something no, like I've that. never, I've never been to the pain summit, but okay. I participated online. I think maybe they asked a couple of my questions. If you were there, okay. you might have heard my name. But besides that, no. Uh, the folks who have met Lee, like a few people that I've met recently, like when I met Nick I saw uh, not too long ago. What the thing you'll notice is that mostly those are people coming through Philly. I'm a, yeah, yeah. I'm a notoriously not well traveled person, um, and I'm I was just talking to my wife way. about this this way the other day. Uh, if it weren't for her, I would live in what is essentially a model home and eat nothing that took any sort of time or, or thought to prepare. There's okay. so many things in life that I genuinely enjoy and am grateful to do when I do travel uh, the times that I have. But without someone else sort of putting that in front of me, it's just not something that I think about. When well, someone goes, don't you want to see the world? Sure. But I just never in, think about it. <laughs> in theory, that sounds like a good idea. Well, yeah, I, have some, I have some family in the Philadelphia area, so uh, maybe we'll take it to the next level sometime. We've interacted oh, online, yeah. now we've interacted hey. in real time. Maybe we'll have to meet in uh, what science fiction writer once called Meet Space. Okay, uh, maybe we'll sounds good. That sometime. Uh, sounds but good. Again, I want to want to thank you for joining me, and uh, this is a really good uh, conversation, and I bet it will uh, further even more interesting conversation in that forum where we kicked this off. So. Uh, you have a uh, you have a good rest of your day and you have a good weekend. You know, I saw the. Can I? I just want to throw in one last thing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm, I'm gonna do. I'm doing two two little quick plugs. Okay. Uh, if anyone is in and around the Philadelphia area, 
tomorrow I'm hosting week four of a four-week discussion series where we view uh, past presentations from the San Diego Pain Summit. Uh, we'll view them and then discuss them. Um, so we're concluding that tomorrow will be the last one at 4.30 in Center City, Philadelphia. You can check Facebook for more details. And then also I'll be hosting at the Philadelphia School of Massage and Body Work uh, a satellite uh, live broadcast of the San Diego Pain Summit happening this year. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's going to be a free event. So if you're unable to make it out and maybe you don't have the scratch to rub together to get the live stream at home or you want to just be able to do it in a group of people so that you can have a discussion, come on out to Center City, Philadelphia. I'll be hosting all of the broadcast live uh, events from this year's summit uh, for free. So come on out and if you're around Philly. Outstanding. Well, good. I'm glad you were able to get that in. And I, I hope yeah. some people get that. I hope some people uh, learn about that in time to take advantage of it. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you, Brian. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care. Bye.